We're going to have the Bible reading now. It's Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 11, 9. Deuteronomy t- chapter 10 from verse 12 to chapter 11, verse 9. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God, of the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is the one you he is the one you praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were seventy in all. Now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws and his commands always. Remember today that your children were not the ones who saw and experienced the discipline of the Lord your God, his majesty, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm, the signs He performed and the things he did in the heart of Egypt, both to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his whole country. What he did to the Egyptian army, to its horses and chariots, how he overwhelmed them with the waters of the Red Sea as they were pursuing you, and how the Lord brought lasting ruin on them. It was not your children who saw what he did for you in the wilderness until you arrived at this place. And what he did for Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab the Reubenite, when the sun, when the earth opened its mouth right in the middle of all Israel and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and everything living that belonged to them. But it was your own eyes that saw all these great things the Lord has done. Observe, therefore, all the commands I am giving you today so that you may have the strength to go in in and take over the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give to them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. May the Lord reveal his understanding of his word today to us. Father, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, for the blessing of your word and for those who are gifted to share your word to us, your people. We thank you, Father, for uh, your protection and your, uh, your raising up of people with certain gifts for the sake of your glory. We pray, Father, as we work together as a nation of people called sons of Jesus, sons of the Most High God, Lord, that we would um, be diligent in hearing what you would have to say to us this morning, Lord, that we would uh, apply what we learn, that you would be glorified in us. We do pray, Father, for the many things that we do here in Cessna Congregational Church, Lord, all the activities for those people who are doing things like music and uh, leading in singing and worship. Lord, for those people involved in uh, uh, the uh, sound equipment and the IT and, Lord, for the things like the events. Um, I know the amount of work that goes into organising and running events. We just want to thank you for them. We thank you, Father, for the Sunday school 
program. And Lord, we just pray that you would raise those people with gifts, Lord, to serve you and to serve you well um, as we uh, as we move into the future. So, Lord, we just uh, pray for Tom. May your Holy Spirit minister through him to us. May your Holy Spirit minister to us that we will bring you glory and honour in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Good morning, church. I'll just have another quick word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that through the scripture this morning, Christ may be made visible and that we would worship him in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Recently, there has been media attention on men murdering women in domestic violence. Over the past few years, a woman has been violently killed in Australia about once a week on average. The deaths so far in 2024 are equivalent to one every four days. It is absolutely devastating that the man, instead of being the protector, becomes the attacker. And instead of committing in marriage and cherishing his wife, he takes the woman's life. Rightly so, the nation has been shocked. And there has been public outcry. One man in anger and frustration lectured politicians on the television, saying, how dare you? You need to be doing more. I don't think it's that hard at all. Indeed, women are losing their lives when a man is called to be a husband who loves his wife like Christ loved the church. Who is the nation turning to for help in this tragedy? Albanese. A man, not to God. They are turning to men, demanding them to solve the problem, to do more, millions of dollars in human meetings to try and solve the problem. Anything but turn to God. Now, I'm not saying the government shouldn't do everything it can to create a safe society, but it is unrealistic to think they can solve the problem of sin when they reject God. How can a mere man solve the problem of the human heart? Well, if he won't do it, vote him out and get another man and trust his promises. He will do it. We keep putting our hope in the politicians and they keep promising to make the world a better place. What is wrong with us? If man is the problem, he cannot also be the solution. The problem is our sinful, selfish, stubborn heart. We need God. We need to cry out to God and to turn to God and to trust God. How long will we stubbornly go our way and look to man to save us? We have rejected God and are reaping the curse. And even with this reality exploding in the world's face every day, they stubbornly and foolishly push on, hoping in humanity. Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. The world has gotten rid of the great and first commandment and is stubbornly trying to do the second, and failing. Stubbornness is thinking it's all about you. Humility is knowing it's all about God. Stubbornness is thinking it's all about you. Humility is knowing it's all about God. In God's word this morning, we see Moses as a preacher to Israel, and over and over again, he exhorts them to love God first with all their heart and soul and be no longer stubborn. He continually reminds them, like a hammer hitting stone, of the reality of God's faithfulness in an attempt to break through their stubbornness. 
He uses any means possible to try to burn his message deep into the hearts of his congregation. Moses, like a good pastor, knows his congregation. In the previous chapter, he said, You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. He has repeatedly expressed concern at Israel's record of failure and its stubborn heart of fear and pride. And now he exhorts the people to get their hearts right. And so the scripture today is very much dealing with the reality of God and the reality of the human heart in response to him. On the plains of Moab, Moses has transitioned from the previous passage to a new emphasis. Moses was reviewing how at Horeb, the covenant was almost disrupted. The people were almost destroyed. But through the grace of God and the intercessory prayer of Moses, disaster was averted. The emphasis of Moses now centers on God's present requirement of his people. The passage starts with a rhetorical question in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? And now, because of who he is and what he has done, what does he require of you? What is right? What is a right response? To love him and to obey him. What God requires of man is a proper attitude of heart. God is God, and he loved and saved them from Egypt. Now they should love and obey him in worship. Love, then obey. Throughout this passage, Moses reminds the people who God is and what he has done for them in history and exhorts them to respond rightly to him for their good and so they may take the land he is giving them. Verse 14 and 15. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose you above all peoples. So God is loving, and he loved and chose Israel. The Lord of all creation was gracious to Israel and loved them when they didn't deserve or earn it. Therefore, here is how they should respond. Verse 16, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Well, what does this mean? Circumcision was an external sign of the covenant. Moses calls on the people to make their circumcision an internal matter of the heart, to be committed to God in the heart and therefore live out the meaning of the physical sign. Internal love would lead to external obedience. The earliest reference to this metaphor occurs in Leviticus 26, 41. There God spoke of the people's uncircumcised heart being humbled, so they would make amends for their iniquity, treachery, and hostility toward him. So it could be read, humble your heart. Be tender-hearted, not hard-hearted. Be in awe of him. See your unworthiness and rebellion and see his love and praise him. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Don't be stubborn and stiff-necked and set in your ways. Before Stephen is stoned to death by the Sanhedrin in Acts, Toward the end of his sermon, he says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. The Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit and not by the letter. Linking to Christians today, George Whitfield, a leader in the evangelical revival of the 18th century, put it like this, the Holy Spirit needs to make you anew 
a bare outward profession of being called after his name is insufficient. Rather, he is a true Christian who is one inwardly, whose baptism is that of the heart in the spirit. So, from all of this, true religion does not consist in merely fulfilling religious duties, but rather in the union of the soul with God. And Christ formed within. To the hearing of the gospel, do you come poor in spirit and open to hear it, or stubborn and prejudiced against God? People can do religious things, but be far from God in their hearts. People can honour God with their lips, but be far from God in their hearts. People can come to church on Sunday, but be far from God in their hearts. Heartless worship is vanity and meaningless. Like Israel, we often forget that unless we are walking in the ways of the Lord during the rest of the week, nothing we do in worship on Sunday or any other day will please God. Mouthing words of devotion ring hollow without the life of devotion. Israel's first allegiance was to be to the Lord, not to the law. Love, then obey. You need a broken and contrite heart in love for the Lord, and then you'll have a new heart to obey the Lord. The Lord is not a tack onto your life. He should be the Lord of your life. In verse 17, God is not partial and takes no bribe. To try to keep, to try to keep God's commandments and yet desire in your heart to continue in sin is to try to offer God a bribe using the obedience to the law as money to buy sin time. Do you come to church to feel okay about practicing sin during the week? Whether sacrificing a bull or sacrificing a Sunday, if it is a bribe so that you feel good to go on sinning, then it's the wrong attitude of heart. Many on the last day will try to bribe God with their works to get into heaven. God is just and takes no bribe. Ultimately, there is the need for God's gracious action within the heart of Israel. If Israel is to achieve faithful obedience to God and his covenant, and so this points forward to the coming of the promised Messiah. God had freed them from slavery in Egypt but they were still slaves to their stubborn hearts and sin. The ideal life in the land that they were about to go into was for each individual and Israel as a whole to display fervent love for God as their right response to God's love for them. And this was to show the rest of the world the true God. Later in Deuteronomy in chapter 30, verse 6, it says, the Lord, your God, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. So people may recognize their need of God, their helplessness, their hopelessness, their stubbornness and brokenness and repent. But if they are ever going to change, stop hating God and start loving God, he has to do the heart transplant and that heart circumcision. Anyone who trusted in their own ability to keep the law instead of trusting in God alone experienced only spiritual death. Clearly, Moses was spiritually alive. Moses goes on to preach to Israel about what God has done in particular historical events. The first one, God's signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt and what he did to the army of Egypt, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them and he destroyed them. 
The second, what God did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place. The third, what God did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. Moses repeatedly emphasizes how their eyes have seen all of the great work of the Lord that he did. You have seen it. So how can you be so stubborn? Where is your fear, your love, your trust? You have seen his faithfulness, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his love, his patience, his provision, his discipline. You have witnessed his loving kindness and you have witnessed his wrath against rebels who oppose him and try to exalt themselves above him. You have trembled at his voice. Be humble. Be no longer stubborn. Respond reverently and rightly. Earlier, prior to the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them. In spite of. In stubbornness. Now it is post-wandering. And they are again about to enter the promised land. Moses is reminding them of the history with a decision about the future. God has promised them victory. The land he commands them to go in and take is already theirs. They simply just must trust and obey. God will give it to them. God will lead them where his grace will provide and his power will protect. The Israelites have seen the powerful hand of God at work and they now must walk by faith and not by sight and love, trust and obey their God. Trust God because he has proven himself trustworthy. And when you are in the promised land, chapter 11, verse 16, take care lest your hearts be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you will perish. Don't be deceived. Don't believe lies. Don't believe opinions. Don't believe other gods have done it for you. Don't believe you have done it for yourself. Believe God who has shown himself true. Hold fast to him. We have seen the stubbornness of Israel and more generally the stubbornness of the human heart. And our world, in spite of God's authority and his greatness. And we see this when God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Lord Jesus Christ. Never a man spoke like him. He spoke with authority and preached good news to the poor and freedom to the captives of sin. And he performed many signs with authority over wind and waves, demons, disease, and even death. Yet he was gentle and lowly in heart. A bruised reed he would not break, and a smouldering wick he would not quench. He had compassion on the multitudes and fed them and cared for them and healed them. He lamented over Jerusalem and wanted to gather them together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and they were not willing. In other words, they were stubborn. He wanted people to come to him to find life and rest for their souls, but many would not. Many were stubborn. We can see this stubborn heart and sinfulness often in the New Testament. A good example is when the Lord Jesus healed a man born blind in John chapter 9. A physical miracle happened. Jesus did it on the Sabbath, and he did it by making mud, which the Pharisees said was against the Sabbath law. And so a conflict was unleashed, and as the conflict progressed, it became plain that the blind beggar was seeing reality more and more clearly, and the Pharisees were seeing reality less and less clearly. The beggar moved from not seeing anything to seeing Jesus as a man, to seeing him as a prophet, to worshipping him, worshipping him. But the Pharisees moved in the opposite direction. 
in verse 16, this man is not from God. Verse 22, if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Verse 24, this man is a sinner. Verse 34 to the beggar, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? The Pharisees became more and more stubborn. The former blind man was amazed at their stubbornness, saying, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Jesus told the blind man that it was for judgment I came into the world. People were being divided by Christ. As he saved people by truth and love and righteousness, a division happened and rebellion was revealed and people were confirmed in their unbelief. He put a difference between men by revealing the thoughts of many hearts and laying open men's true characters by this one test, whether they were well or ill affected by him. Humbled or stiff-necked. Jesus confirmed this when he denounced cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they didn't repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So when you see God and hear of God, we will all respond either in repentance or stubbornness. And this is the way the world is this morning. Many are lovers of self and have already decided that they love their opinions and they have their prejudices before they come to the sign or the truth. So it simply cannot mean anything to them. It'll make their neck more stiff because it threatens their position. Prejudice means to prejudge. And you can prejudge God and Christ before you've seen and heard. One atheist said even if he saw Christ, if Christ appeared to him, or if he heard the voice of God, he would say he must be hallucinating or going mad or that it was a natural phenomenon or coincidence, or even aliens. Many have already stubbornly decided God is not real, and they will remain invincibly ignorant to the facts, die in their sin, and go to hell. How many people have you heard say, if there was a God and he showed me a sign, then I would believe in him? To someone demanding a sign, I would say, firstly, God is God. He does his will, not yours. And the Bible is itself a sign. It is the best-selling book. It's in many homes, on many shelves. It's even to be found in motel drawers. It's God's book. It is God's book. It is the inspired history record and the only true revelation of God. He has faithfully preserved his word. He, it records the many mighty works of God, and there it shows you many things God has done in history. Will you believe the history of men of the past who conquered lands and armies and World War I and World War II, but you won't believe the historical truth of God and his people? Deuteronomy alone records and repeats many signs and wonders, because the Israelites needed reminding. They were rebellious and set in their ways. So to the person saying they would believe if they saw a sign from God, I would secondly say, don't be too sure. You're very saying that and ignoring the gospel and the facts of God in history, as well as in creation, is just so you can continue in your sin, because you love sin and are set in your ways. The Israelites saw many signs and were still stubborn and rebellious. Yeah, they trembled at the trembled as they heard the voice of God, and still they turned from him. Who are you that you are more than they? 
The problem lies in the human heart, not in the lack of evidence. It's a way of excusing yourself so you can continue in sin. God's word says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? People are stubborn in their ways because they love sin. A celebrity tried to explain away his affair with his stepdaughter by saying, the heart wants what it wants. The heart wants what it wants. The world is stubborn and resents any challenges to its lifestyle choices. In stubbornness, people suppress the truth to do what they want. For the one needing a sign, let us remember what the Lord Jesus said to some people seeking a sign from him. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He meant the greatest event in human history, his death and resurrection. He knew it was coming. Indeed, it's why he came. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. It is astonishing that in the very face of God incarnate, some demanded a sign. How stubborn and ignorant and foolish and blind. Finally, to the person asking for a sign, I would say, you have it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He so loved you loved me, loved us foolish and filthy, helpless and hopeless sinners. The sign is Jesus, who walked this earth 2,000 years ago, is God. He gave himself as a ransom for many by humbling himself even to death on a cross. And bursting the bands of death asunder, he rose victorious from the grave. He lives, he reigns, he is coming again. Never again will such a sign happen. Many of the great signs and wonders he has performed can never be repeated. They are recorded in history to bear witness to us. Christ died once for all. He won't be sacrificed again. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And he appeared to more than 500 people. Hear this good news that has been heralded for two, those 2,000 years and repent and believe if you haven't. I tell you that if you don't, you walk as enemies of God and the cross of Christ, humanity's only hope. Even to this, there would still be some who would respond, well, that's just your opinion. My friend, I have no business being up here just speaking my opinion. I am preaching the truth, history that has happened. The sad reality is that some stubbornly love their opinion more than the truth. We see that every day, and we see that with the Israelites. Look at what God has done in Christ, and therefore respond to him. Turn from sin, trust in him. See your sin, see his mercy, call on his name, he will save, and he will help. He will send the Holy Spirit and make you new and live with you. Biblical faith is not a leap in the dark. It is not something you accept because you have no evidence for it. On the contrary, biblical faith is based on reasons. God has made himself known. Jesus has risen from the dead. God has shown himself throughout history and ultimately in his son, and people accept or reject him in their hearts. Verse 26, the blessing and the curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments, the curse if you do not obey the commandments. We have all disobeyed and are cursed, but in Christ shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The God who spoke the law to Moses and the Israelites is the same God incarnate in human form, who fulfilled the law. Christ has fulfilled the law that no man could and done away with sacrifices by offering a greater and perfect sacrifice himself. Jesus is the perfect man who loved and obeyed God perfectly and died to save sinners. 
Praise God that our sinful, stubborn hearts can be forgiven and made like Christ's. As Moses was reminding the people what God had done for them and how they should respond, so I am reminding you what God has done for us in Christ and how we should respond by turning our stiff necks away from rebellion and we should trust in his saving grace. Today, my dear friend, if you are not a Christian, don't, stif- don't stiffen your neck to Christ in the face of overwhelming evidence. Stubbornness will stop a sinner running like a child to the only saviour. The sad and sorry state of the world today is because people love sin more than their own soul, more than the truth, more than God. Don't love your body and your life and lose it and your soul. Don't love your opinions and feelings more than fact, more than evidence. Such stubbornness is foolishness. A great cliff and chasm called death and judgment lies before the world and Christians stand and love and preach and warn and yet the world ignores and stubbornly runs headlong over the cliff and perishes. Multitudes are passing from time into eternity without the dear Lord and Saviour by their side. What a terrifying and terrible reality. Call on him and he will embrace you. Let's pray. Our great God, thank you for everything you have done for us when we didn't deserve it and couldn't earn it. Thank you for everything you've done for us throughout history and for the Israelites, but by sending your son, your only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life as a free gift from you. Thank you for being gracious with a world that can be so stubborn and hateful. Thank, thank you that you let people continue to breathe even when those breaths are used against you. Thank you that Christ clears our debt and all of the breaths that we've used in rebellion are washed away. Thank you that we can have new life and be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name, amen.